been warning about the dangers of climate change, consequent impact on people's health for a number of years, but we're in a situation where the problems seem to be getting far worse rather mm. than better. I mean, how would you characterise where we currently are? I think we're in an absolute crisis. I mean, we're bordering on catastrophe now. And it's a problem because it's very hard to identify that unless one's attuned to the signals. But I think uh, human life itself is threatened and certainly the welfare and well-being of, of the billions of people on the planet is now under immediate and grave threat. T talk to me a bit about the, the relationship between climate change and health because people often see them as completely separate. Mm. So what is the connection and why is it important to understand? Well, it's a very good question because many years ago, if I went to talk on the issue, people would say, well, it's, it's just a question of a few more people getting a bit of heat stroke but maybe a few less people will die of cold in the winter, so there probably isn't very much to worry about. But essentially it comes down to not just mean temperatures, but weather instability. And it's often a combination of those two things that impact on human health. So people will die from heat waves, and we know that they do. As temperatures rise, more people die. Um, we know that uh, heat brings with it unstable weather, so one gets droughts and floods. We've been seeing those. And with that, we get crop failure, um, we get starvation, we get economic collapse, we get loss of habitation. And with those things, we get migration and conflict. And on top of those, of course, we get a whole raft of other things, changes in aeroallergens, such as pollens, longer pollen season, different sorts of pollen. We get changes in ground level pollution, such as ozone at, sea, at sort of low level. As temperatures go up, pollution drives more production of ozone. So there's a whole raft of different things, not just excess temperature on its own. So where do you see us in terms of saving the world? Because nothing much seems to be happening. No, I think it's a desperately difficult problem and, it, and it's worth perhaps even starting with the sorts of patients I look after in an intensive care unit because they're often chronically ill. They're often ill with a burden of other diseases, none of which in itself is life-threatening. And then along comes a sudden punch. They get an acute pneumonia or they get run over by a car. And then they're very difficult to salvage. And even if we didn't have climate change, the Earth's ecosystem is under absolutely massive pressure. You know, we've got extinction of huge numbers of species a minute. Um, and that's due to loss of habitation, destruction of environment, pollution, and so forth. So even without climate change, we've got that. So this second pulse coming on is going to produce an ecosystem collapse, which itself will be very hard to fix. You're an interesting communicator because you're not just in medicine, you've written children's books. I said mm. you've done a movie. That's all about different forms of communication. I mean, given the scale of the problems and the lack of action, we seem to fail to communicate this issue properly. I mean, well, I think there have been a, a number of things. I think green issues overall have often been viewed as well-intentioned, but slightly woolly-minded, unscientific, imprecise, you know, well-meaning, but not really rationally grounded. And that's, that's a sort of pejorative tar brush that's been applied to it, I think, from a long time ago and isn't necessarily the case. I think we had a problem with scientists because, as a scientist, we deal in uncertainty and we communicate that in terms of p-values. So, put simply, a p of point. 05 means that it's 95% certain to be due to think you're in a 5% chance that it isn't. And whenever one puts those on, even P with lots of noughts on after it, and you say, well, there's you know, a, a 1 in 10 million chance this isn't due to X, people say, oh, so there's a chance it isn't. And the message people receive is that there's, a, there's an element of uncertainty about it, and, and that's a scientific communication problem. I think the third thing is there was a message came out really in these sorts of issues that you can't tell people bad news. And I've always felt that was erroneous. The idea was that you had to sell um, the new world that was safe from climate change, sell the positive message that came with it. And I felt that was duplicitous and, and a bad idea. There's the feeling though that if you tell people you know, the seriousness of it, that they withdraw even further. I think we can learn a little bit from other public communications, though. I mean, if you look at whether it's Pugsy Bear or, or any of the big, big appeals, there's no shying away from showing people the brutal truth. But what is immediately followed up with is, uh, and now you can do something, just phone this number, or, or here's your way to engage. And I guess because none of us have been clear in communicating the and what part of the message, that's been the problem. A degree. Even people who get it go, and, and what do I do about this? In terms of um, 
looking at a more systems-based approach. So, mm. so a bit like medicine. So medicine's gone down this route of specialisms. Yeah. And, and one of the dangers is, is like global development. You know, yeah. you can't just deal with water. You have to also deal with sanitation. You have to do with education and yes. you have to do with livelihood. So We've always built government legislation, regulation on, on silos, which compete for resource. You know, they've got to champion their office or whatever their remit actually is. And joining together the big vision is much harder. Now, of course, if one looks at something like climate change and resource degradation, there is a way of joining the whole thing together. And that if one says, well, actually, we're going to change the way we do business, the way we make our energy, how we live our lives, and put that as a cross-cutting theme, you know, the CBI will be happy. They're already reporting, actually, that green growth is the big growth, and they're pushing hard for it. So it works for business. It works for military security, where we're increasingly threatened. It works for energy security, it works for air quality, it works for transport, it certainly works for health because quite out with the danger of climate change, low carbon living turns out to be exceedingly healthy. It lowers the burden of a whole range of malignancies, strokes, heart attacks, diabetes, osteoporosis, a whole raft of other things. So here's a sort of cross-cutting theme where business, transport, education, health, security all gain together as long as everyone can sing from that, that one same hymn sheet. So do you think actually we need a more disruptive approach to dealing with these issues? So I've been thinking about this only in the last few days, saying, well, actually, having met some people in business who really want to see things happen, and you've got a lot of NGOs, everyone from Women's Institute to RSPB and WWF, all wanting to see this better world, surely we need to convene that purchasing power and bring it to the right people to help the markets change in the right direction, because many businesses are not evil. They, they, they just have to do the best for their shareholders. And if we can do the best for their shareholders in a different way by bringing the market to them, that's got to be a good thing. But there has been this barrier. There's been, you know, advocacy or uh, championing of causes that tend to have meant a lot of finger pointing. And perhaps it does need to be joined together. So look at, looking ahead to the hazard, yeah. let's just say, we continue business as usual, you know, small pockets of change, but actually looking ahead 20 years and, and going back to your original statement about it's important to be honest. Mm. I don't know if the, it's the right scale, but let's say 20 years. What would you see the world looking like from climate, but also particularly from a health position if we continue on the trajectory we currently are? Primarily, my concern would be starvation because Whilst original projections were saying, well, you know, there'll be areas that don't grow food very well, but actually with rising temperatures and more CO2, some areas might do a lot better, and actually some areas could grow a lot more. That was before people really understood that rising temperatures lead to weather instability, and actually you can have a great growing season, but if it floods at the wrong time, or there's the cold snap at the wrong time, or the heat wave at the wrong time, it can decimate the crop. And we no longer seem to hold the reserves of food to see nation states or regions through when those things happen. Those sorts of events make us very, very vulnerable. And that's the thing I would personally foresee, and I could be wrong, as being the major driver. I think it'll be starvation, migration and conflict. And at what scale? Because it's very easy to say starvation, you see, you see you know, one country having a problem. I mean, what, what scale are you, are you talking about? Well, you know, it's very worse, of course. It could be global because we're all vulnerable. Great Britain doesn't in any way grow all of its own food. And even if it did, we're not immune to extreme weather events either. We're all interdependent now. And when people are poor, and there are people in this country who are struggling now through no fault of their own with poverty, when the food becomes expensive, what are they meant to do? So I think this will affect everybody. I think this will, will affect every single one of us. So, so when it comes to, let's say, the UK, you're saying that there could be people who are starving in the UK in 20 years' time? Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks.